OK, we're going to try and answer the question, heavy duty powertrains, what is the best energy source? And in my presentation, um, I'm going to, um, I should say that I'm not anti internal combustion engine and I'm not anti electric motors and batteries. I believe all of those <laughs> play their part. And I'm just trying to set the scene from my perspective. So the types of machines or vehicles that we, that we could include in this would be, for example, uh, tethered uh, machines. We have a wire going to some form of machine or even a vehicle, and you would take that energy from the um, national grid, typically. And then you've got semi-tethered, something like an underground train here. Some of you would have travelled on these today. Um, this is where you get the electricity into the train. Uh, via the rails in that case, or it could be other trains where you have the wi overhead wires. And again, they take the energy from the grid. And then lastly, we've got the non-tethered type, um, where you've got an onboard energy source. Um, it gives you geographic flexibility. And really, that's the focus of this particular presentation. So what we're going to do together, we're going to look at different types of mach uh, vehicle, machine, powertrain systems. Uh, look at global and local emissions, energy and power. We're going to do a comparison between an IC engine and an IC engine hybrid versus a pure battery powertrain. And then we're going to look at the utility of diesel fuel and IC engines, energy production and conclusions. And then I'm going to finish up with a f what I think are a few key challenges for the industry. And hopefully that might uh, contribute uh, with some of the debate. Um, I should say also, this, this, this talk, I think right at the very end, may actually tip into the next presentation from Oriel as well. So we'll, we'll see how we get on with that. OK, so different types of vehicle or machine powertrain systems. Um, IC engines, um, they have an onboard uh, energy supply, which is the fuel tank. And it puts that energy into the, uh, into the powertrain, goes into the engine and then transmissions ultimately. And that drives the vehicle, or the, or, the, or the wheels, or the load. And that's one form of powertrain in, at a high level. Um, and then you've got IC engine hybrid. Some people call these hybrid electric machines. But they're really IC engine hybrids, where you have a fuel tank. That's the primary onboard energy source. And, and that puts energy into the engine and the transmission. And then that drives the load. But cunningly connected to this, we've got a a, a, re a regeneration system where we can bank and trade energy. So when we've got excess energy, maybe kinetic energy, we can bank some of that and then use it later. But still we've got the primary onboard energy source is the fuel tank. Um, and then the, the final high level type is the uh, battery electric machine where the primary onboard energy source is the battery. And that can feed energy into the motors and the transmission and they drive the wheels or the load. And, and in fact, the energy can flow backwards as well. I know a lot of you know a lot about these machines already. I'm just trying to set the scene. Uh, and I should also say there's subsets of these. There, there's some hybrids where you can plug in the battery, the regeneration device, uh, and you can store a little bit of energy on that uh, at the outset of the journey. And you can also have um, battery electric machines where you might have a, a range extender of some kind where an IC engine with a fuel tank is topping up the battery. So a number of options, and I should say that on a hybrid, it doesn't have to be a battery. It could be a flywheel or some other, some other means, hydraulic or something, uh, to store energy. Now, in the media, and I'm sure the, the media uh, folks here today don't get this wrong, but uh, one, of my, uh, one of my passions is to try and remind everyone um, that when people often in the media say, I see engines versus hybrids and electrics, I, I personally believe they put the boundary in the wrong place. And uh, because when you think about it, if the primary onboard energy source is a fuel tank and a fuel tank, I, I would argue that the correct boundary is actually here. So IC engines and IC engine hybrids is one form of technology, and the other technology is battery electric machines, and they're quite different. But so often in the, in the media, people just say hybrids and electrics, and you might even hear a, a, something like an electric aeroplane. And then when you look deeper in the article, they, they start talking about there's a gas turbine on board and an engine 
and, uh, and uh, sorry, a gas turbine and, and a fuel tank, and then that actually feeds the propellers. So um, we've got to actually understand where we are in the technology. So I, I would say a more appropriate te technology classification would be here. So that's one of my pet subjects. Okay, so global and local emissions. We've talked about CO2 emissions, absolutely important. If we have, uh, the, the Earth is uh, 8,000 miles in diameter. If, if you had, a, if you had a, a globe in your house, just 300 millimetres in diameter, the atmosphere is only between about one and two millimetres all the way around. So we've really got to make sure that stays clean, especially with CO2. And one way to reduce CO2 is to have f high fuel economy. Uh, and you can also decarbonise fuel as well. And I'll say more about that later. Now, in terms of local emissions, I would say these are extremely important to get local emissions down as well. So in cities and in construction sites and in uh, agricultural settings. And when you look at the Euro 6 heavy duty emissions, they're actually very low and they are compliant. So despite, again, what people sometimes think about non-compliance, they are compliant and they are very low. And the, and the levels are going down all the time. So NOx, we're down to about, uh, well, we are down to exactly 5% of the NOx uh, from the Euro 1 uh, levels, and particulate matter at 2.8%. So these have been, uh, been uh, driven down for many years, and they're going down and down and down all the time. And we need to continue to do that. It's a real challenge, but we need to do it. Now, I know everyone here knows the difference between um, what energy is and what power is, but I often see... Uh, little errors in, in various uh, magazines and that. And, and people seem to get confused a little bit between kilowatts and kilowatt hours. And uh, so I, I prefer to use uh, proper units for all this. Um, and energy, as you know, is measured in joules. And uh, high values allow us to do a lot of work. And, uh, and power is the rate of energy. That's in joules per second. And I know you know this already. And that's in watts. So high values allow us to do a lot of energy transfer quickly or a lot of work quickly. And they are obviously two different things. Now, how many people here have seen the film Back to the Future? How many people have seen that? So I might show a clip in a minute. So it's a bit of a spoiler if you have seen the film or you haven't seen the film. If you have seen it, it's fine. So now in the Back to the Future film, they go back in time. They've got this DeLorean car. And to make the flux capacitor work, it needs 1.21 gigawatts of power to make it work. So it's 1.21 billion watts. So what they actually needed to, to do this, they couldn't have a power supply to provide that. They used a lightning strike. Now, lightning doesn't have much energy in it, but it, it actually acts very, very quickly. So you have a lot of joules over a very sp uh, short space of time, so you get a lot of watts. And so you'll see the car going along now, getting that power to make the flux capacitor work so it can travel back to the future. So let's have a look at this and see if it works. So that's an example of the difference between energy and power. OK, so what we're going to do in our analysis, we're going to look at energy in joules. And remember, high values allow us to do a lot of, lot of work. And I've got a couple of uh, heavy-duty machines here. There's a, a kind of backhoe loader um, or a truck. And uh, on these vehicles, you need a, prime, a primary onboard energy store if you're going to move it around, and it's not going to be tethered. And so the question is, is it best to have a fuel tank or a battery pack? So what's best? So on our IC engine or an IC engine hybrid, we're going to have a fuel tank. And on a pure battery electric machine, we're going to have a battery pack of some kind. And the battery pack would take its energy from the, the grid, normally. And the uh, fuel tank gets its energy from the, the fuel pump. So now... I'm going to do some analysis now uh, on battery technology. And if I talk about back battery technology, uh, people are always going to say, ah, well, that's what it is now, but batteries are getting better all the time. 
and they're going to be absolutely right. Batteries are improving all the time. So what we're going to do, we're actually going to use some data. We're going to go forward in the to, to the future now. We're going to go to uh, 2035, and we're going to use some of the, uh, the target values for batteries that have been set by the Faraday Challenge. So the Automotive Council in 2017, about 20 months ago, set several targets for the battery industry to meet by 2035. And uh, basically they found the best cell costs for the best batteries, and these are actually quite optimistic, to try and get them down to, to much lower values. So they've got things like £100 per kilowatt hour, um, to 38 pounds per kilowatt hour by 2035. Now I've converted these to proper units, which is joules, um, because I don't like kilowatt hours. And so it's 28 pounds per megajoule in this case, down to 10 pounds per megajoule. So in our analysis, we're going to use the 2035 values as our datum. Um, and then the target is also uh, to double the battery's uh, energy cell density from 250 watt hours, which I think is a, a, a puzzling unit, really. So converting it to proper units, we're going to have 0.9 of a megajoule per kilogram. We're going to double that to 1.8 megajoules per kilogram over that period of time. A couple of other things that are, are, are mentioned in the Faraday Challenge, things like batteries working under much wider ranges of, of ambient temperatures, going very cold down to minus 40, and going to plus 80 degrees Celsius. And this is quite a big challenge. Um, if you put your mobile phone in the fridge and then you try and charge it up, it doesn't charge up very well and it doesn't work very well. So batteries don't like very cold temperatures. So I'm not anti-battery, they're great for some applications. Um, and also to try and improve the battery pack's recyclability uh, from sort of 50% level, 10 to 50%, up to 95%. Now it's fair to say um, the internal combustion engines pretty well all already work at those ambients and they, are, and they are mostly recycled anyway, so they're already there. So what we're going to do, we're going to use the values in red and we're going to do a, an example here just looking at the en energy store because at the end of the, the day, a battery is just an energy store. And I know you know that, but it's just an energy store. Um, and this analysis, we're going to look at, uh, say, a vehicle with 150 litres uh, of diesel fuel tank. It's fairly modest for some trucks. Some application, that's more than enough for, for a day if you're going around the city centre. Uh, if you're going in line haul trucks, that's way too little. So I'm using quite a low value there. Uh, for an off-highway machine, that might do one shift or maybe two shifts, depending on the, the duty cycle. And so this is just for the energy store. And we're going to assume that the engine's brake thermal efficiency, or the brake fuel conversion efficiency, more correctly, is only 33%. They're actually higher than that, more like 38%, but we're going to assume it's only 33%. And we're going to assume that a battery electric system is 100% efficient. They're usually less than that, again. Um, and so using the 2035 uh, target values for our 150 litre fuel tank, the effective energy in that is 1.77 billion joules of energy. It's actually three times that, but we're assuming the engine's only 33% efficient. Okay? And so our battery, to do the same amount of work over its duty cycle, would have to have the same amount of energy in it. So if we look at the masses, the mass of the, uh, the fuel tank in, in that uh, truck or whatever is 160 kilograms, including the fuel. And the battery weighs uh, 983 kilograms. And that's just for the cells, but it does include the electrons, which is good. So, um, but the, and the actual pack will be about 50% heavier than this, but the, the cells will be about that sort of level. And the costs, the costs are uh, just a fuel tank is really cheap, even for the sensors and pipes, about 100 pounds. But the battery um, would be, at today's price, well, 2035, but with today's prices will be, uh, 17,000 pounds. Now if we you look at the values as they are now, or back in 2017 when the, uh, the best batteries uh, were looked at, so the best batteries for there, just for the cells, again the same amount of energy and uh, the mass of that is about 1,900 kilograms and the cost for let's say a backhoe loader or a small truck will be 49,000 pounds. Now, I'm not saying whether this is viable or not, because there will be techno-economic legal tipping points for the choice for particular applications. 
there'll be some great applications where you would have a battery, and there'll be some great applications where you'd have a fuel tank. It absolutely depends on the application. And this doesn't include, obviously, the cost of, if you're doing the batteries, it doesn't include the cost of the motors and the coolers, controllers, or the engines or the transmission or anything like that, and doesn't include the total cost of ownership. But it does look at the stark upfront cost you have when you're looking at fairly modest levels of energy store on a commercial vehicle. If you go for a 44-ton uh, uh, Mercedes Actros uh, truck, that's got a a 1,420-litre uh, fuel tank. In fact, in fact, it's got three fuel tanks. And the, the cell mass for that, 2035, is about nine tonnes. And for now, it's about 18 tonnes. And that's just for the cell. So you're going to be about 25, maybe 30, 30 tonnes of the vehicle will, will be a big, a big proportion of the 44-tonne limit. And the cost is, um, is pretty high, to say the least, at £468,000. Now, obviously, you may not need that much energy on the, on, the, on the vehicle. But in this case, that's what's running around at the moment, and that's the challenge. Now, I would say that that isn't the big problem uh, with fully battery electric machines. The big problem, I believe, is getting the energy into the battery. That's the real challenge. So we've got to try and get, we're we going back to our 150 litres of diesel now, the, the amount of energy in that, 1.77 billion joules, going to try and get that into the fuel tank. And if you use a standard uh, filling station uh, for this, uh, I've timed this uh, at BP and Shell uh, fuel stations, um, you, you get, it's just over a second per litre. So it takes a 50, it, to get uh, 150 litres into the tank, uh, 50 litres per minute, it takes three minutes. And so if you work out the number of uh, watts that is in joules per second, it works out that you've got about nine megawatts flowing through your hand. So it's quite a high le level of power, if you like. It's not power in one sense, but the amount of energy per second is extremely high. Um, and uh, in fact, it's three times that, but we're assuming the, en the engine is only 33% efficient. Now, if you, uh, if you try to get nine megawatts of, of power into the, um, the battery, that is pretty impractical. That, that, you'd need about a two to 300 litre sweat volume diesel generator to get that type of power. That's a really, really high value. And uh, if you put batteries on charge, they get warm. Even if you've got a 5% uh, heating effect, which is fairly modest, that will be, well, about 450 kilowatts of heat you've got to dissipate. So it's, a, it's an enormous challenge. So we don't do that. So what we do, we use what we call fast chargers. Um, say 120 kilowatt fast charger system is considered fast at the moment, although they're going up, and I'll say more about that in a minute. And if you do that, that will take four hours to uh, fill up if it's linear. But as you know, charging batteries isn't linear. It goes up, uh, get it to 80%. It takes you about that much time again to get to the last 20%. So if it's linear, it's four hours. In reality, it will be longer. Um, but I would argue that that isn't necessarily the big problem. So 120 kilowatts is quite a challenge. I mean, just 30, 13 amp sockets, that will be 41 of those running in parallel for four hours. Um, the, big act, the big issue, from, from my perspective, is access to the charger, both time access and geographic access to that. And that is a really, really big challenge. So even if we can get the costs and the mass right, and we're happy with the time to fill up, because some applications, four hours fill up time is fine. The big challenge is, do we have access to the charger? So again, looking at our Actros truck, the filling time for that, if you have one nozzle going into it, is 28 minutes. Um, the equivalent charging time on the 120 kilowatt charging power is 39 hours. And if you've got a 500 kilowatt charging system, which people are talking about, that's nine hours. That would actually have a profound impact on the uh, techno-economic decisions of whether you go for a battery electric machine, even if the battery was very light and very small. But the media tends to be slightly against diesel engines, and uh, it, it absolutely depends on the application whether they're the best thing. Um, but uh, I think it's worth just pointing out the few of their attributes they have. Um, firstly, the oil reserves, the diesel fuel, um, they are very high. For, for, for several years now, we've pretty well flatlined with an oil reserve production ratio of about 50 years. So that means 
how much reserve we've got compared to how much we use per year. So it's, it's quite long, really. Um, uh, also, the production cost of fuel is actually low. You use a remarkably small amount of energy to turn the crude oil into useful fuel, just a few percent to do that, and even get it to the point of use. Um, it's relatively, relatively safe and cheap to store. You can even have 3,500 litres of similar type fuel in your house. That's legal. You can have 3,500 litres of fuel, fuel oil just sitting in your home if you want to. So it's easy to store and handle. It's high density liquid. You can run it at atmospheric pressure and temperatures. And also you get the fast fueling that we talked about just now. At this 9 megawatts if you want to. And it's widely available. Now in terms of engines, um, they've got a lot of attributes. There's, there's no, no coincidence that there's 1.5 billion IC engines in the world. Um, high energy uh, from the fuel tank, high power from the engine. You can run them untethered. They're relatively low cost. The durability is high. They have the ability to operate at extreme uh, in ambient conditions. Um, now, there is a challenge with local emissions, um, um, uh, but these are demonstrably going down and down and down all the time. And then we also got fuel versatility. Now, in terms of energy production, energy, electrical energy, one of its fantastic attributes is you can make it in all kinds of ways. And I really like electricity. If, I, if I'm running something at home, you know, I like use electricity for all kinds of things in the house. If I'm using a little drill or something, is battery powered or it has a wire going to it. I wouldn't dream about having a little diesel powered one. It will be, you know, just plug it in, electricity is great. And the great thing about electrical energy, you can make it from nuclear, wind, gas, biomass, coal, solar, hydro. All of those can, can make our electricity. The challenge is, is distributing it and then storing it. That's a really, really tough challenge. Now, hydrocarbon fuels that we run in our that we release inside our IC engines have many sources, including renewable. In other words, we're not tied to crude oil. We can actually use um, different types of fuels. We can actually go for these uh, renewable type fuels uh, if we can get the scale right. So though oil supplies are large, we have other options. Um, this is a little chart here that Dave Richardson, who's just, uh, just retired from JLR, Gave, gave me this uh, to show. He's given me permission to show his little chart here. And this just shows some of the fuels that you can run and release, hopefully in a benign way, inside an IC engine. So you've got diesel and gasoline, or petrol in other words, LPG. You've got compressed natural gas, liquefied natural gas. They can run on hydrogen very well if you want to. Um, and you've got all these other routes here, like GTL, gas to liquid. But you can also have these renewable vectors as well. So they are really, uh, they're actually a very good platform to cater for all uh, different scenarios in the future if we, can, if we want to seek out different types of fuel vectors. Okay, so we've been through a lot of stuff now. Um, we've been through types of machines, global and local emissions, energy and power. We did our comparison between our pure battery electric powertrain and an IC engine, IC engine hybrid. We looked at the utility of the diesel engine and the IC engines, energy production. Now I'm going to come to the conclusions and then I'll talk about key challenges. My personal view, and uh, I have got my flak jacket on underneath here if people want to shoot me. Um, I believe that pure battery electric powertrains are currently considered impractical for many types of vehicles. And this is expected to remain the same for many years. I'm not saying all, but many. Um, IC engine and or IC engine hybrid powertrains are expected to remain the dominant system for most untethered, heavy duty, on-road and off-road machines for many years because of the low cost, fast fueling, high energy, energy access, excellent utility, and indeed the fuel versatility. And it's all about decarbonizing the fuel. Emissions are at very low levels um, and are being further reduced. Um, Okay, so a couple of key challenges. If you boil this right down to the basics, in my opinion, um, the biggest fundamental challenges for the IC engine and IC engine hybrid is tailpipe emissions. Uh, they, we need to do something about that, and we are. There's a lot of groups here today are working on this. And for battery 
uh, electric powertrains, the biggest deal is battery charging in terms of access and speed and things like that. And then in terms of the energy supply, the real challenge is net decarbonisation of fuels and net decarbonisation of electricity. And the industry is doing all of these things. It's, it's a team sport. It's not people saying, I'm just going to work on IC engines or just batteries. The whole community, of which many are reflected here today, are working on all these areas. And really it comes down to, in terms of the technology choice influences, it comes down to the physics in the wider sense, which includes uh, chemistry and all the other things. Legislation, that makes a profound difference, and ultimately economics wins. So all of these things are going to affect the future. Now, earlier on in the talk, and I'm going to finish in two minutes, um, we talked about the film Back to the Future, and uh, another spoiler coming up now if you haven't seen it, um, although I should say homework this, uh, this weekend is to watch the film, if you haven't seen it. Um, in, the, in the end of the film, they come back from the future, and he comes back with a new type of propulsion device um, that needs a different type of fuel. And the reason I want to show this is for, for two reasons. One, it neatly links into the next speaker's talk, but uh, also, um, it, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, my firm belief is all about how you get the energy into the energy store on the mobile vehicle. That's the real challenge, how quickly you can do that. And there's a variety of ways of doing it. And look how quickly he puts this readily available fuel into his engine. He does it really fast. So let's have a look at the, the clip. Marty! You've got to come back with me! Where? Back to the future! Wait a minute, what are you doing, Doc? I need fuel! Go ahead, quick, get in the car! No, 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 Doc, I just got here, okay? Jennifer's here, we're gonna take the new truck for a spin. Well, bring it along! This concerns her, too. Wait a minute, Doc. Well, what are you talking about? What happens to us in the future? Will we become assholes or something? No, 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 Marty. Both you and Jennifer turn out fine. It's your kids, Marty. Something has got to be done about your kids. Hey, Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going. We don't need roads. Thank you very much.